and season. We're a week away from the deadline happening. So let's start there with the poll question, Russ. I feel like you'll have a thought here. When should the deadline be? So do we leave it in the August 1st range? Obviously, year to year, it could change. They they don't want to have it on a weekend, whatever. But around August 1st, do you want to push back a couple weeks to mid-August, a whole month to September 1? Or I didn't get to finish, but my selection would be back to two deadlines. I actually like where we'd have this deadline here, like Kratzy said, and you have that that waiver deadline, even though it's a little confusing for some. That's the deadline where like we could see the Scherzer-Verlander big money deals that get to pass through waivers. Uh- what the third wild card spot has done. It's forced teams, and we talked about this over the last couple of weeks, it's forced teams to decide, all right, am I going to be a buyer or am I going to be a seller? I think with the old system, you kind of had to, you got the, the ability to straddle the fence for another month where it's like, ah, I'm a buyer, yeah, I might be a seller. And I think you you see, we see more activity because teams have to decide, all right, what am I going to be? No, I don't think that's straddling the fence. I think the biggest thing is, like you might get hamstrung and something happens, you can still pick up a guy. You can still, like Scotty said, all right, you know, we're going to make a midnight, midnight decision on Verlander and pick up a contract because no one else is going to pick up that contract. I like that. I don't feel like it's kicking the can down the road. I feel like it's like, oh crap, we still need some help here. And that kind of stuff can still happen. Do you feel like we've, seen more activity though like over the last couple of years since we've gone to the one the one deadline as opposed to having the waiver deadline and then the trade deadline because i feel like we have because they, i do do think teams feel like all right i won't be able to do anything until the offseason now I, I i hear what you're saying but i also i would like to see it play out a little bit longer because i think the whole impending cba that had to do with i mean think about some of the big names that that left the cubs Right in your city there, they just started selling people off because they didn't know what was going to happen with the CBA. They didn't. They were getting value. They didn't know who was going to get draft picks from different stuff from keeping guys. And I think, I think this year, I don't think it's going to be quite the same. But hey, it's been quiet. It. It's been quiet. And for me, I'm always going because I don't have any. Like I'm, I'm not rooting for a team. I'm just rooting for action and for our sport. What makes our sport most relevant in the dog days of August? More trade talk. Even though it's different trade talk, it's more limited trade talk because guys have to pass through waivers. That's that's my concept there. So anyway, yeah. everyone can still vote. Watch stadium.com slash foul territory. Okay, Russ, let's start with your neck of the woods. The Chicago White Sox are definitely, definitely sellers. How far will they go? Well, I think you got to start with guys like Lucas Giolito, Lance Lynn, guys who don't have much time left on those contracts and much time of club control. Every contender is looking for bullpen help. And then if if I'm Rick Hahn, you'd have to blow me away with the deal for me to move Dylan Cease. And then I think the other guy people talk about is Tim Anderson, who has not played like Tim Anderson for the whole season, but since the, the All-Star break has an OPS of almost 900. So I would say you let TA build that value back up in the second half. And then if you still wanted to move him, you move him in the offseason as opposed to right now. Let me let me ask you this. So Eric and I had a conversation about Tim Anderson moving, and I said I think it would be a, the, a good idea to move him. He said his value is too high. like Too low. Too low. Sorry. Yeah. He said his value is too low. Sorry. But what what do you think on that situation? I, I think any team would, would take him in a heartbeat, no? I think – I think there is something to that side of like a change of scenery, right? Like just a guy who's been really not like himself. And if you put him in a situation where if he's in LA with the Dodgers or somewhere like that, where now you're around other superstars, you're around Mookie Betts, you're around Freddie Freeman, right? You're around JD Martinez, these guys who've won before and you're in that environment, maybe that helps you raise your level of production to where teams have seen you. If I'm a team like the Dodgers, sure, who doesn't want to buy low on Tim Anderson right now? Because I feel with a couple different tweaks, being in an environment of winning, you're going to get the best version of that player. So I I can understand that. I just think from the White Sox perspective, a guy like a Tim Anderson, when when he is producing, he's so valuable in terms of trade. I just don't know if you want to sell low with the fact that you really don't have that many assets that you'll be able to get decent prospect capital back for in return. All right. You said Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn's value is lower or higher than TA's value right now? 
I think it's higher in terms of you look at where he is contractually, where he could be a rental. He could opt out uh, at the end of this year. And I also think he's a guy that has that playoff experience. And if I'm a young team with a young rotation, having a guy like that in the room where young guys can bounce things off of him, like I think of him for a, a team like the, the Arizona Diamondbacks. You're about to be in, in a heated NL West race. Or if I'm the Baltimore Orioles, having a guy like that in the room where he's pitched in the AL East before against the Red Sox of the world, and he's pitched for the Yankees, he's pitched against the Toronto Blue Jays, I think that's really valuable to, to, to teams like that who are younger staffs. I set the over-under on the White Sox, three and a half players traded. What are you taking? All right, three and a half. So the three we named, Gilito, Lynn Graveman, and that would put us at one more. <laughs> Somebody packaged up? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, Give him the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like because you see names thrown out there for the White Sox. Like you see Yaman Kata's name out there, where it, for a guy that's been injured most of the 2023 season, I don't necessarily see that one. But could somebody take a flyer on a Joe Kelly, right? A guy who's pitched in the postseason, even though you look at the numbers, it's not what we've usually seen in the past from Joe Kelly. Could you pick him up for for a team and say, all right, we don't need Joe Kelly of 2019, 2020, 2021, but if you could be a guy who could pitch in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning for us to bridge to our guys in the back end, I think that's something that could happen too. That's an easy over for me. All right. By the White over. Sox. All that to say yes. I should have I didn't, I didn't actually say an answer. <laughs> yes, yes, yes isn't an over-under. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're taking one, the over. They, they have yes, other over. bullpen arms, at least one other bullpen arm out of, I mean, half the guys I'm looking at, at least one of them will get dealt. That's it. Oh, Kenya Middleton. Easy over. Yeah, Middleton. I there love, are a lot of names Middleton. on here. Even like if a team just needs depth, like a, a Tuki Toussaint, um, Joe Kelly, if they want to pay some money down. There's plenty of names on here, in my mind, that could get dealt. Easy over. They're easy over. Book it. And and Kratz already owes me one on a bet. So Oof. I might double or nothing. I don't know. Okay. What do you think? Are you over under? Oh, I'm over on. Over. Okay. I uh, couldn't I couldn't set it at four and a half, so that's why I set it at high. three and a half. Too high. Okay. Padres, in or out. Ken Rosenthal had his fair territory show released as usual on Mondays. And I think surprised some when he was pretty confident that this team is still going to buy. Now are they going to buy at the top of the market? Not necessarily, but do you believe that this Padres team, despite still being mediocre since the All-Star break, is going to say, you know what, screw it. Let's add a couple more pieces and see what happens. I mean, I don't think that that's unrealistic, right? When you look at a team like the Padres, it's a team when I talk to people in the industry about the Padres, they're the wild card because nobody really knows what they are like are they the team we've seen for the most of 2023 or they team the team that we thought was on paper a team that was probably going to compete for a world series and i think you're in this situation if you're aj preller and the padres where it's like well, we went all in we went out and we got soto at the deadline last year we got josh Hader, and we brought in xander bogars to play with manny machado and now fernando tatis jr you almost have to be committed to going for it i personally and i've said it the last couple of weeks, I still think that they have uh, a stretch of 20 games of really good baseball. But will that be enough with the teams that are there in fourth place in the NLS? You have three teams in front of you. Do you hope that you can play better than a young team like the Arizona Diamondbacks that haven't been in this position together before? Maybe. Do you feel like you have enough top end talent to be better than the San Francisco Giants? Do you feel like you have enough starting pitching? So, from what you said, Scott, like, I don't necessarily think they'll make the major move because they already have a lot of really talented top end talent, but adding on the margins does make sense. And when you, you know, talk about, look what the Braves did this morning, right? Getting a guy like a Pierce Johnson teams that are really talented. You add on the margins because really good teams win those trades. They win on the margins and those guys usually end up being productive in October. Yeah. Now along those lines, you looked at there's six games out in the wild card. So it's something like, what is the biggest thing they need? And the one thing that guy that has been brought up was Jake Cronenworth. Like he's a guy that's been talked about maybe leaving, maybe not. But do you think I just – the team to me, I always – I look on paper and I see I'm like, man, why aren't these guys not winning? They have such a solid team. 
if I'm then, I'm trying to get another piece and, you know, I'm trying not to move my big guns, but I mean, how much do they have in the, in the young, young gun era now too? Like, do they have the prospects? That's the biggest thing. I, I don't know what they should really do. It's a tough question. I, I, they've been able to make a lot of moves over the last couple of seasons because they did have that really strong farm system. And I think you look at a guy like a Ethan Salas, who I don't know if they really want to move uh, a guy who was 17 a couple of weeks ago, hitting almost 900 uh, in advanced a, like that's, that's a guy that I think a lot of teams would like to get their hands on, but I don't think uh, the Padres would be inclined to move him. And you're right. I think with Jake Cronenworth, that was a guy that they extended right in this past off season. And you expected him to continue to ascend. Hasn't really had that, uh, production that you thought you'd see from him after what we've seen the last couple of years. But if I'm, if I'm the Padres, maybe adding a little bit of, a little bit more pitching, right? You, you look at what Blake Snell has been able to do over his last two games has an ERA of 0.62. That is, uh, he's really showing out. He's showing us that he's back to being Cy Young Blake Snell, but I don't think playoff teams, I don't think teams that really want to compete for that world series can ever have enough starting pitching. And I think there's going to be enough, starters available even if it's not the high-end guys like marcus stroman maybe a jordan montgomery right like maybe that's somebody that can fit for what they want to do maybe adding a little bit of bullpen help in the back end like a guy like a kendall graveman who we just talked about i think those wouldn't likely be the pieces that they add not the major okay let's move to um the mets and i think it's pretty clear cut they're seven and a half out of a wild card they're seven games under 500 Who's more likely to get dealt after we also talked earlier about a JP Morosi tweet saying that the angels are still listening on offers, which is smart. I mean, they should listen. And then if they suddenly collapse over the next week and their owner changes his mind, they're already lined up. Who's more likely to get dealt Scherzer or Otani? I like the question because it makes me really think about it. From a lot of different <laughs> I, I, I say, I'll say Shohei from the standpoint of, it's the guy who's going to be the free agent at the end of the season. If I'm a team that is looking to win in 2023, I'm not thinking about two years from now. I'm not thinking about prospects that we have coming up two years from now. I'm trying to win this season. And I look at a guy in Shohei Otani and say, okay, that's the guy who's going to hit second or third for me. That's the guy that I'm going to put at the top of my rotation for the next two months and hopefully in October as well. Like I'm going to do everything I can to get that guy. Like, but who is that team, right? Who, is fearless enough to say what happens this offseason doesn't matter. I know Shohei's going to get $600 million, but I'm going to give up the prospect capital it takes to bring him in and hopefully go all in on this season. So I'm going to say Shohei. Okay. I like it. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and then lastly, let's get a fan question in there uh, based on our White Sox talk from earlier. AJ Early, big White Sox guy in our chat, usually says, why is Rick Hahn getting a chance to do a third rebuild in 11 seasons when they only have two winning seasons in those 11 seasons. And one of them was the COVID year, which was <laughs> doesn't really count. So doesn't you, count. You've won once in 10 years with two rebuilds. And now this is going to be number three if they start to tear it down. It's a, it's, it's a really fair question from a fan base that has been waiting for a long time for them to get things right. And the more you think about the White Sox in the last 20 years, you look at that 2005 team, that 2006 team, a, a little bit differently, where in, instead of saying, all right, they built it the right way, did they catch lightning in a bottle? And it really worked out for them. Uh, you, you look at since, since Todd was there, right? You look at that, the, the Samarja, Marcus Simeon trade, and then they move on from those guys. And you bring in Yoan Mankata. You trade Chris Sale. And then that doesn't work. Now you have this core of players where the mix just isn't right. And you have some success in there and you, you get some things to go your way. And then you just, you, it, it's always felt like the White Sox thought that it was their time and that they deserve to be the best team in the AL Central. And because they did everything the right way as far as their rebuild, and they had the best farm system in baseball and they had the prospects and they had the young guns, and they made the right trades that, all right, everything's going to come together. Here is our, our, our window. And it never happened. And to answer the question of why does Rick Hahn get the opportunity to do this a third time, if that's the direction they're going to go in, which it looks like they will, until 
I see with my own eyes that Jerry Reinsdorf is going to fire a general manager, there's no evidence for us to believe that that's going to be the case. And so if, if that's not, if we're going to just go off of what we've seen, I imagine that Rick does get another opportunity to try to get this thing right for the White Sox. Jerry doesn't fire anybody, but I need you more definitively, okay? Here, I need a definitive answer. And quick, we're tight on time. Okay. okay. <laughs> Do the Cubs trade more guys or the White Sox trade more guys at the break? White Sox. White Sox. Wow. That was easy. Cubs have more of the value, but yeah. maybe not as many of the Not as players. many guys? Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Stroman and Bellinger leading the pack there. Maybe a reliever, so mm-hmm. it's close. Kratz is really quizzing everyone today. He's making everyone think. Number I five. love it. I love it, too. I love the <laughs> pop quiz stuff, too. Russ, good to see you. We'll talk later in the week when there's some more trades. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. We're going to come back and pop off on two very unique topics. Zach Campbell stealing baseballs and the Marlins did. Diff- 